Welcome to Sheboygan County Government, working for you. My name is Adam Payne and co-host of this program with Chairman Mike Vandersteen. Yes, Chairman Mike Vandersteen, back in the hot seat next to me. As you know, he's been gone the past few months, and it's good to have you back, Mike. Thanks much, Adam. It's good to be back in the saddle again. We have a, one of our 21 department heads with us today, Mike Collard, our HR director. And as you know, every month we try to bring a different department to you or a area of interest in county government. And Mike, thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Glad to be here. Why don't you start by sharing a little bit about yourself and the primary roles of the HR department? Well, I came to Sheboygan County in December of 2002. So it's been uh, over eight, what is it, nine years now. And uh, almost nine years now, over eight years and uh, worked with a couple of other smaller counties before coming here and um, I'm the leader of a four-person department now in human resources and we deal with all aspects of our Sheboygan County employees including compensation issues and you know rules and regulations and hiring and firing and um, employee benefits of course is a big part of it as well. And obviously you have a lot of strengths but one of the ones I appreciate is your your legal background and your your law degree that certainly comes in handy from time to time. It does help. There are so many uh, rules and regulations uh, and negotiations involved, especially with the uh, union environment we have. Now the county, as we were just discussing off the air, is one of the largest employers in Sheboygan County, though we've gotten smaller, not larger. Uh, please mm -hmm. give our viewers a flavor for what is the size of Sheboygan County? How many employees do we have? Mm -hmm. Well, there are a total of 932 employees currently, if you count everybody, all different categories of employees. Now, that includes people such as the county board members uh, themselves and other citizen board members, anyone that gets a, even a per diem check uh, occasionally, and temporary employees as well. So there are about 850 regular full-time and part-time employees with the county currently. And then those employees, some are mm -hmm. represented, some aren't represented. How many unions do we have? We have eight different union groups, three different unions, but eight different bargaining units, and uh, about 745 of those 850-some employees are represented by one of the unions in terms of the regular employees. So it's about 88% of our workforce we consider to be unionized now. And right now, uh, well, we'll talk about mm -hmm. that a little bit more in the program, but right now all of the eight unions have agreements that are in place, correct? Yes, we have bargaining agreements in place now running through the end of next year, December of 2012. So we're fortunate to have those things resolved, although there are some interesting steps along the way to that point. Right. Now, as many of our viewers know, it seems as though the budget process never ends for government at any, any level, but uh, for Sheboygan County specifically, the county board adopts it in November, and you take a deep breath and, and perhaps briefly appreciate that you've gotten the job done and then you start work on the next. And of course, one of our greatest expenses is associated with labor. And it's not just wages. What else or what are some of the key factors associated with the costs of our staff? Right, we have about $45 million of, of taxpayer money in wages every year. But in addition to that, it's 11 million or so in tax levy that goes just to the health insurance benefit or health and dental benefit that we provide to, to our employees. So that's by far the next biggest item uh, in the county budget, perhaps after wages. Uh, after that, we also pay uh, some other benefits and the, the next largest would be the uh, Wisconsin Retirement System. Uh, we do make the contributions for the retirement system for our employees, uh, for most of them, and that of course is changing as well. But uh, the total of those payments is about four and a half million dollars a year. So, of course, salary or your wages, mm -hmm. your health insurance costs, and uh, pension costs. And as mm -hmm. I'm sure all of our viewers are aware, there's been a lot of consternation in Madison, a very contentious issue the last few months with the governor's repair bill and uh, essentially asking or requiring, frankly, many employees to contribute more toward the cost of their uh, pension and also contribute toward health insurance. Please set the stage for us a little bit. What was it that the governor introduced and what's the status of the legislation? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, the status is it's currently on hold, placed on hold by a restraining order issued by the circuit court in Madison, Judge Sumi, of course, and that's been obviously very well publicized. Uh, and so we're not sure when that law will actually take effect, uh, but the way the law is written, it, it affects our collective bargaining situation quite a bit, and it also affects our non-union employees. Uh, the biggest impact, especially for non-union employees, 
is that it uh, requires the employee to pay half of those pension costs. And our pension system, our, our state pension system, is a very well-run system. It's, it's one of the very few state pension systems that is fully funded or considered fully funded. But that requires those steep contributions every year. And up till now, employees have not been paying toward it. It's been just the county that's paid. Uh, now with the budget repair bill, non-union employees will have to pay half of what the total contributions are. And as collective bargaining agreements expire, other employees will also have to pay half. So I think sometimes there's a misunderstanding in the community. community. Well, I, th I thought employees were only paying 5.8% of their pension. Please that's clarify 5. that. That's 5.8% of their wages. That's right. The total contribution for most employees, and there are some different categories, uh, requires that the county pay 11.6% of wages into that system. So that's, a very, that's why it's such a high expense. Half of that 11.6%, of course, is 5.8%. So that amount will change every year depending on what the total is, determined by the actuaries in Madison. But uh, currently, 5.8% of wages is uh, being paid into those uh, the retirement accounts by non-union employees and now some of our union employees as well. So now a little better than mm -hmm. half of our employees are contributing toward their pension. Mm -hmm. Most are paying the 5.8, some a little less depending on the contract status. And what about health insurance costs? On average, mm -hmm. what are employees uh, contributing there? Well, right now, um, most of our employees are paying, uh, well, I'd say a majority are paying 12.5% of the premium. Uh, all full-time employees are paying at least 10%, depending on the status of their union contracts. And many of those are going up to, to 12 and a half, or in some cases, 15% of premium next year in 2012. Right. And that's another area, I think, of misunderstanding. When the governor proposed the budget repair bill and um, asked that all employees make these concessions, um, at the same time, there were cuts made to local government, Sheboygan County government, and the thought was, at least from the state level, that though we're going to be passing on these cuts in shared revenue or other uh, cuts that are necessary to balance the state budget, we're also going to pass on this additional flexibility to local units of government where now they can get more concessions from their employees in the form of pension and health insurance contributions. But the fact is that in Sheboygan County, because of the proactive steps of Mike Collard and the HR committee and the full county board, our employees have been contributing more toward their health insurance for a number of years now. So mm -hmm. it isn't a one for one, though Sheboygan County will without question be part of the solution. And without question, those additional contributions will help us balance our budget. It isn't a one for one. We're still gonna have to mm -hmm. make cuts in other areas or health insurance plan design changes or what have you, we're gonna to have to get creative. Mike, as, as you've looked at your tenure here the last eight or nine years, uh, without question, we have made plan design changes, we have incrementally increased the contribution from employees, but as you know, in the governor's budget repair bill, it didn't treat all employees the same. Some will be contributing more toward the, their pension, some won't be. Touch on that, please. Sure, the, the bill exempts sworn law enforcement personnel from having to pay the 5.8% of wages toward retirement or toward half or, or any portion really of their retirement obligations, uh, which actually would pay more for the law enforcement personnel because of the higher risks and the better uh, retirement benefit that goes along with those positions. But uh, uh, those employees will not be required to pay anything under the bill. So of course, we're gonna have to follow that that lead and uh, they won't be be part of the mix. Also, as you said, on health insurance, we even before the bill was introduced, we had agreements with several unions to go to 12 and a half percent of the premium, which was the goal really announced by the governors. We were already most of the way toward the goal on health insurance. And just to be clear though, the law enforcement aren't required to immediately begin mm -hmm. making that 5.8 percent contribution. Mm -hmm. That doesn't preclude them from contributing in the future, it's just that it will be negotiated. It's always a matter for negotiation, and so the law would change that by taking it away from negotiations and, and requiring it. But for, for sworn law enforcement, such as our Sheriff's Department deputies, yes, that will be subject of our next negotiation. And one where, frankly, we're going to need all employees to step up and be part of that solution and helping contribute. Last question before I turn it over to Mike. All this consternation at the state level, um, you know, it, it certainly, I mean, whether you support what's been proposed or not, in my opinion, whether it's friendship, 
marriage or good government, mm -hmm. respect and compromise are also always essential. And I think the process at the state level, one could conclude, has not been real respectful between Democrats and Republicans and, and has created a lot of consternation. Uh, how has it impacted employees here other than them contributing more? What's the morale, do you think, of staff at the, at the county? Well, obviously our employees are very concerned about the law and the changes taking place in their union contracts and the changes taking place for non-union employees. So there's a lot of concern, there are a lot of thoughts, but overall I'm still very proud of the way people have reacted uh, among our county workforce. Uh, people have handled it very professionally, they've been concerned, have disagreements, uh, been talking about it, but that hasn't kept them from keeping their focus on providing the services that they provide. It hasn't kept them from treating each other and management with respect, uh, and I hope we treat, continue to treat them with respect, and I certainly believe we have done so. And uh, we haven't had any disruption of activities based on that. Uh, when the protests first started in Madison, and I know many of our viewers have seen reports of the teachers calling in sick and the doctors signing sick notes and a lot of behavior I personally didn't like to see. Some of our employees were at those protests, but they all arranged to take leave to do that and got permission to have leave from their jobs. I don't know of anyone who called in sick falsely. And I can back that up with some numbers. We went and looked at our sick time usage for that period when the protests were going on. It was actually less sick time usage in our county workforce than there was the previous month before the budget repair bill was introduced. So no sign of any disruption of our workforce. Disagreements, yes, but uh, attention to business is still there. Very good. Thank you, Mike. Mike, the county board just recently approved uh, two contracts, and they had included significant contributions, concessions by our employees of those two groups. Could you give us a little bit of an update on, on our eight contracts and then and, and focus a little bit on Rocky Knoll, especially, and, and why uh, that one was so important for us? Sure. There are, um, as I said, eight <clears throat> bargaining units that we have, and all eight are now on the same timetable, which we like to see. They're all settled in terms of our agreements through the end of 2012. Six of them, or I should say seven of them, were settled before the budget repair bill uh, was uh, enacted, let's say. Uh, so those weren't really so much at issue. Uh, one of them was unsettled, which was our largest group, Supportive Services. Uh, but we did two things. We, we settled the Supportive Services group after the budget repair bill, which was a little bit controversial, but there were some good reasons for it, I think. And then we reopened the contract with most of our employees at Rocky Knoll Healthcare Facility, uh, even though we didn't have to since we already had a contract. Uh, that Rocky Knoll bargaining group contract, I would say, is the most interesting one I've been involved in negotiating in the, in the 13 years I've been doing these negotiations uh, for different county governments. Uh, it really makes a lot of changes, more than I've ever seen made in a, in a union contract. Um, and there are some really remarkable features to it. Uh, first of all, it goes out for a longer term than you normally see. We're actually settled with that group now through the year 2016. And you may wonder why, but there, again, are some real advantages to the county in doing it that way, and advantages to the union in that they uh, get to keep the union agreement in place under the old law until then. Uh, so it really is a win-win situation. And it came about, I think, because the employees, to their credit, recognized that you know, the health care facility is an optional uh, venture for the county to be in, and that they saw themselves more and more as really in partnership with the county to keep Rocky Knoll going the way it is. It's a great facility, as you know, and uh, everyone wanted to keep it going as a county facility. The question is, would the economics permit us to do that? And the employees really stepped up and saw themselves as partners in that decision and realized they had to make some changes in order to, to help us reduce expenses, make it economically viable. So there was really a trade-off there. Uh, and as a result, we made a lot of changes that will help save money, uh, not just in the long term through 2016, but right now in 2011 and 2012, which we could not have saved if we had not done that longer-term deal. Uh, under the old contract, the, the facility was losing quite a bit of money currently because of low census and, and higher expenses, a lot of factors. Uh, as a result of this contract, 
the county will save about $2 million in 2011 and 2012, which we would not have saved if we had not renegotiated and extended the contract. Mike, what were some of the real specific uh, interesting things that you yeah. negotiated in that contract, and are some of those going to be kind of a template for future contracts that we're going to uh, do with other employee groups after the, uh, the current contracts expire? I don't know if there'll be a template, but I think there are two provisions that I'd really call out as being something that, that you don't see very often in public sector contracts. Uh, the first is the graduated benefits provisions. A new hire, a new employee starting out at Rocky Knoll now will not have health insurance benefits or most of the other benefits that cost the county money uh, right away when they're hired. Those benefits will be phased in gradually over a three-year period. Uh, so there's a tremendous cost savings to the county associated with that and it also provides more incentive to employees to continue to develop in their careers and uh, stay with Rocky Knoll uh, once they learn their jobs and have a greater expertise there. They're more valuable to us and they get a greater benefit as compensation for that. So it also will hopefully go to reduce our turnover out there, which is always an issue in a nursing home industry. Uh, the second thing, which I have never seen before, frankly, in a public sector contract, uh, but really like to see, is the uh, incentive bonus payments. We locked in that contract, the, the overall wage increases, to 1% over the next four years, five years, uh, which is probably, very likely, I should say, lower than the rate of inflation. The only other pay increase will result from incentive bonus pay that employees can get. That bonus pay has to be earned every year or it won't be paid. And it's earned through a combination of factors such as is the facility, Rocky Knoll as a whole, meeting its goals towards uh, census, number of, of residents, reducing overtime shifts, and reducing a uh, number of employees who call off a shift and just don't show up for work or, or you know, whether it's a sick excuse or, or what have you. Uh, the more employees step up and contribute to those facility-wide goals, they're going to make a little extra money. Now, that's the kind of thing you might see in a public company, private business, uh, where they really want to bring employees in and provide bonus based on the company's performance. And we have something like that in place right now at Rocky Knoll as a result of this contract. Those are some real neat provisions. Our largest group, our supportive services group, uh, we began their contract negotiations early on, but we didn't finish up with the approval of that contract until after the budget repair bill had been approved. And um, in, in doing that, uh, we, we had the option to just wait and, and let that kick in with the budget repair bill provisions. Why was it a good move for the county board to renegotiate this contract as well? I think there are really three reasons. Uh, the first reason is it puts that union on the same timetable as all of our other unions, which is good to have people lined up so they perceive they're being treated fairly and equally. Uh, but there are two other more important, I think, reasons, one of which is that uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in when that budget repair bill will take effect. And a bird in the hand, as they say, is worth two in the bush. And so right now, you know, we're achieving a million dollars in savings that we might not achieve. And if that budget repair bill doesn't take effect, the longer that goes, the more uncertainty there is, the more we pass up the potential for savings. By agreeing to a contract now, we ended up with most of the benefits to the county that the budget repair bill would give us. Certainly not all, but most. And we have them right now as opposed to at some unknown point in the future when that takes effect. The third reason is there actually are some features of our agreement that are better for the county than if we had just followed the budget repair bill. For instance, under the budget repair bill, overall wage increases uh, may go up to the rate of inflation, the consumer price index increases. Uh, so we think it would be very hard to negotiate under the budget repair bill a wage increase less than that. But our wage increases that we have now negotiated as part of the contract are actually less than they probably would be under the budget repair bill in terms of the overall across the board increases. Mike, um, by doing that contract at the time we did, this affects the, uh, the union as far as uh, being recertified and things like that. The budget repair bill had certain provisions, and I think now, um, is it true that they can't um, decertify that union until the end of the contract, if they, even if they wanted to? That's right. The budget repair bill, uh, as you know, would require 
the unions to be recertified every year through a vote of the employees. And that's one thing that obviously is different because we reached a contract. We're not having to vote to recertify for 2012. They will have to have a vote and recertify for 2013 and beyond. But that is certainly a, a motivation I think the union had in wanting to keep you know, the, the mandatory union membership and union dues provisions in place, as well as a lot of the other contract language in place at least through the end of 2012. Although I would say that the, the two biggest priorities the county had in changing contract language were addressed in the agreement we had. So we didn't leave all of the contract language alone either. We got all of the financial advantages of the budget repair bill and probably a little further, and we got the two big contract language items that we wanted in exchange for letting the rest of the contract language and the union provisions stay in place. That's great. Now, as far as our non-represented employees, the ones that aren't represented by mm -hmm. a union, how are we dealing with those employees right now? Well, we've uh, elected, or I should say the Human Resources Committee of the County Board has determined that it would start treating non-union employees as if, essentially, the provisions of the budget repair bill were in effect right now. So, so Adam and I are, are paying right now 5.8% of our wages toward uh, retirement benefits, as are all the other non-union employees in the county today other than elected officials. Now, as we go forward and these uh, contracts that end at the end of 2012 expire, what new policies mm -hmm. and procedures are we going to have to put mm -hmm. in place as we go into 2013? Well, most of our union contracts contain something like 30 pages full of work rules and rules involving benefits and how sick days can be taken and what vacation schedules are and how employee work schedules may be changed and a host of other things. All of those things have been mainly dealt with through those union contracts since the 1970s at the county level. Uh, all those, those things after December 2012 are going to be determined by county policy. And so we really have to dust off our employee policies and really determine if they apply the way we want them to and whether they do the things we want to be doing to provide employees with a good work environment and still give departments the flexibility they need to, to manage the workforce and to make changes when they need to change them. So we're going to have to look at every one of those policies as a county government uh, between now and, and the end of 2013 and really make sure that, that we put all those work rules, scheduling, benefit, and other policies in place in the way that will meet the needs of the department. Well, it sounds like, you know, normally you have an off year when you don't have to do negotiations, mm -hmm. but that off year is going to be busy writing all right. those new policies and get, getting ready for, uh, for that expiration of those contracts. As I said to the Human Resources Committee, you know, you may look forward to not having to do union negotiations to the extent we've done them every year, although we still have to negotiate about wages after 2013, uh, but it's actually going to make our job harder and make more work because we actually now have to really make decisions about what benefits ought to be, what the work rules should be, and we can't hide behind the union agreements anymore for those things. Okay, well with that, I'll hand it back over to Adam. In one of the other areas we discussed along the, the contracts and the new policies and procedures is, personally, I'm glad that it didn't hit us starting next week or next month. Uh, not only do we have everyone lined up to expire 12 31 2012 a consistent approach locked in the savings that we need to be successful but as Mike just alluded to it gives us some time to prepare those policies and procedures mm -hmm. and not be the guinea pig there are going to be some municipalities out there that are going to have to knee-jerk react immediately to begin developing these whereas we can take the next year benefit from the experience of others and hopefully make less mistakes. Absolutely, and an employee grievance procedure is a good example of that. Every county and every municipality now has to develop its own grievance procedure to take the place of the one in the union contracts. We have the luxury of being able to sit back and I can collect the 12 best examples I find and then see if I can improve uh, taking the best uh, of each of them before we put ours into place. It's it's often good to lead, but this is an area where it's going to be nice to have the benefit of others' experience. Uh, speaking of experience, you've done a lot of wonderful things in your eight, nine years here, as you mentioned earlier, whether it's the negotiation of these contracts, uh, policy and procedure development, health plan design changes, and one of the areas that I know we both take a lot of pride in is the county establishing its own in-health clinic. Uh, please 
um, share with our viewers when it was that we created the County and Health Clinic and why did we? What were the benefits? Well, it'll be three years ago this June. And so uh, one of the interesting things going on is we need to renegotiate our contract to extend our clinic operation because we did hire a private company to come in and basically run a nurse practitioner clinic for, just for our employees. And uh, that does two things. One is it provides our employees with a great option to get basic health care from someone who's completely independent, devoted to their care and their overall well-being and nothing else. Uh, and that's great for employees. The other thing it does is it really ties together or pulls together all of our county's wellness efforts. If we're spending $11 million of taxpayer money a year just on employee health care, obviously we have an interest in making sure that people are getting the right health care, addressing things when they should be addressed before they become big expensive problems. And that can make a huge difference in that overall health cost increase that we see every year. Now our increases over the last five years have, have been well under 5% per year on average, and most counties, counties statewide, have had an average increase of 8%. So it's efforts like that that really try to keep our cost increases more moderate than, than they otherwise would be. A uh, big part of our efforts in that wellness area now are going to be devoted to uh, increasing participation in these health risk assessments so that each employee in our health plan will have to come in and get some very basic tests done do a report, a report will be prepared based on their history, identifying health risk factors. We offer free health coaching through the clinic so they can address those you know, health risks in the best possible way, uh, the most convenience to the employees. And we're really providing some incentive next year in terms of a reduced health premium contribution for the employees that take, take that risk assessment uh, package and uh, at least get some basic information about what they should be doing for their health. And we'd like to see other local units of government join us. I know we've extended an olive branch to the schools district and to the, the city of Sheboygan, and our hope mm -hmm. is the city of Sheboygan in particular might be joining us sooner rather than later. Very likely, and I think the main holdup right now is just that we are renegotiating that contract, and once we get it established, uh, what we'll be doing uh, for the future with that arrangement, I, I really think we're going to bring some other employers into that clinic, especially the city. Excellent. Excellent overview. We covered a lot of ground. And of course, if you have more questions or want to follow up on any of the information here, please don't hesitate to contact Mike Collard at the HR office or our County Board Chairman Mike Vandersteen. Uh, you can contact the County Clerk's office. All the numbers are in the phone book. But if you contact the County Clerk's office, Julie Glancy, they'll put you in touch with whoever you'd like to assist you. And I want to, again, thank Mike for his leadership and the very good work that he's done. And, you know, we, we aren't one to... to beat our own drum here, but since Chairman Vandersteen has returned from a brief absence here, uh, Chairman Vandersteen now has been the county board chairman three of the last four years, and three of the last four years, Sheboygan County government has reduced its property taxes. We're the only county in the state that's done so. And thanks to Mike's work and the work of the full county board, we've also continued to provide excellent service. We've got excellent morale in the department, in the county, and just a good team in place, good people making good things happen. So we thank you for your support. We thank you for joining us. And again, next month, Aaron Brault will be here to talk a little bit about our non-motorized transportation program. Thanks for joining us.